You're watching the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on electric circuits. The topic of this video is electric circuits and their requirements. And we want to know what is an electric circuit and what requirements must be met in order to establish an electric circuit. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. Imagine two metal plates aligned parallel to one another and having opposite types of charge. There would be an electric field directed from the positive plate to the negative plate. The positive plate would be at high electric potential, the negative plate at low electric potential. And despite the difference in electric potential, there would be no charge flow between the two plates. What's missing is a wire or conductor that connects the two plates. But if we were to connect the two plates with a wire, we would begin to observe positive test charges moving in the direction of the electric field. We would notice that the charge on the top plate would begin to diminish as positive charges leave that plate and as they arrive at the negative plate the charge of that plate would begin to diminish as well until finally they reached a total charge of zero. The electric field would no longer be present and the two plates would be at the same electric potential. When the plates are at the same electric potential the charge flow ceases. While there is a charge flow between the plates this is not an electric circuit. The missing ingredient is a way of pumping positive charges back up onto the positive plate so as to maintain the difference in electric potential, the presence of an electric field, and the continuation of the flow of charge. If you're a physics student, you're probably accustomed to the use of equipment shown here. A pack of electrochemical cells, which we call battery pack, a couple of wires, and a light bulb. And when the final connection is made of that last wire to the terminal of the battery, we notice that the light bulb lights and lights immediately. And when it's finally disconnected, we notice the light bulb is unlit immediately. This highlights the importance of a closed conducting loop that extends from the positive terminal to the negative terminal of the battery. When that closed conducting loop is present, Present, we have an electric circuit as long as there's no breaks or no interruptions. An electric circuit is when you have an actor instance of something going around and around. In this case, it's charge that goes around and around. But circuit is not restricted to the world of physics. We speak of the train circuit, the roller coaster circuit, and even the speaker circuit. In all such cases, there's something that's going around and around. In fact, the word circuit comes from the Latin word circum, which means to go around. One variation of this experiment involves placing a compass needle underneath one of the wires of the circuit. When you do and you make the last connection of the wire to the battery pack, the light bulb lights and the compass needle deflects from its usual orientation. A closed circus, circuit results in a lit bulb and a deflected compass needle. But when you make the disconnection of a wire from the battery pack, the light bulb is no longer lit and the compass needle is no longer deflected. This provides evidence for the claim that something is flowing through the wire. That something must be electrical and we refer to it as charge. We have what we call a current. While I have no Latin word for you, I can tell you that a current involves the movement of charged particles through the closed loop of an electric circuit. A common physics experiment involves giving students a D-cell, a wire, and a bulb and asking them to find as many arrangements as possible that result in a lit bulb. As students begin, they typically find the unsuccessful arrangements first, such as this one here, which lacks a loop formed by the wire as does this arrangement here. Once student re students realize they need to form a loop, they may try something like this with their wire. This is a loop, but it doesn't loop from the positive to the negative terminal, nor does this one. Once students realize they need to take that wire and form a loop that goes from the positive to the negative terminal, they might try this one here, which tends to burn their thumb. This doesn't work because the loop goes from positive to negative terminal, but you'll notice that the light bulb is not a part of this loop. What what all of these arrangements have in common is that they lack the existence of a closed conducting loop that extends from the positive to the negative terminal, with the light bulb being part of that loop. Success with the cell wire bulb experiment is usually promoted when I step in and give a light bulb anatomy lesson that goes something like this. Here is a light bulb and at the top of the diagram you notice there's the glass bulb. That's something you can touch and see, as is the shiny metal side which I'll call the rib side. Then at the very bottom of the bulb you have a conducting element which I'll call the base of the bulb. The base, a conductor, and the rib side, also a conductor, are separated by an insulating material, usually black or gray. Now inside that glass bulb is a filament, 
It's the one part of the light bulb that produces light. When charge flows through the filament, it gets hot and glows and you have light. That filament is supported by two wires. You see what the wire is doing inside of the bulb, but you don't see what it's doing when the wires get to the rib side. So here's how it works. One of the wires is connected to the rib side and the other wire continues down without touching the rib side and touches the base of the light bulb. So in order for the light bulb to light, you must have charge flowing through the filament. If you were to take two wires and connect one of them to the rib side and the other to the rib side, the light bulb will not light. Instead, charge flowing in one of the wires will travel across that conducting material, the rib side, and out the other wire without passing through the filament. If you want the light bulb to light, you have to touch one wire to the rib side and the other wire to the bottom base, and then charge that enters the rib side will travel up through the support wire, through the filament, down the second support wire, and out the bottom base, or vice versa. Once students understand the anatomy of a light bulb, they can find the four successful arrangements of cell, wire, and bulb that result in a lit bulb. Every arrangement must have a closed conducting loop that goes from the positive to the negative terminal with the bulb being part of that loop. Like this arrangement here, or this one, or this one, or this one. These four arrangements of cell, wire, and bulb have one of two things in common. The first is that the base of the bulb is touching the terminal, and charge entering the base goes up through the support wire, across the filament, down the second support wire, and out the rib side of the bulb. There, there's a wire touching the rib side on one of its end, and the other terminal on its other end. The second possibility is that the rib side of the bulb could be touching the terminal and charge entering the rib side of the bulb will travel up through the support wire, across the filament, down the second support wire, and out the base. And there, a wire will be touching the base of the bulb on one of its ends and the other terminal on the other end. The experiments I've been discussing can be summarized by saying there's two requirements for having an electric circuit. And the first one is that there must be a closed conducting pathway that leads from the positive to the negative terminal of the energy source. Here, the energy source can be a cell, a battery, or even an outlet. If you have a closed conducting pathway, you'll have a circuit, and if a light bulb is part of that circuit, it will light. When students are doing the cell wire bulb experiment, they often experiment with a fourth object, such as a paper clip or a paper wad. In the case of the paper clip, it's made of metal, thus a conductor, and it doesn't interrupt the closed conducting pathway. But in the case of the paper wad, the light bulb doesn't light because paper is an insulator and it interrupts the closed conducting pathway. If there's ever a break, an opening, or interruption in this pathway, this loop, then flow will cease. It doesn't matter whether it's charge flow in an electric circuit, water flow in a water circuit at in a water park, or even coaster flow in a coaster circuit at an amusement park. Any interruption of the loop will result in a and in, in will stop the flow. You probably flipped a switch in your home and noticed the light bulb doesn't light. What's going on there? Well, the likelihood is that it's an incandescent light bulb and the filament has broken. A broken filament will interrupt the circuit and we no longer have met the first requirement of having an electric circuit. The second requirement for an electric circuit is you must have a source of energy. We learned quite early that two oppositely charged plates connected by a wire will allow the flow of charge, but that flow is not permanent. It's only temporary. This is not a circuit. In order to have a circuit, you need a means of pumping charge from the negative terminal back up to the positive terminal. This flow of positive charge goes against the electric field, and as such, work must be done on the charge to raise it from the low potential to the high potential. This requires energy, and that's why you need an energy source. What the energy source does is pump charge uphill from the negative terminal against the electric field up to the positive terminal. Using Ben's Franklin, Ben Franklin's language, it takes charge away from or subtracts charge from one of the terminals and adds it to the other terminal. That's the origin of the plus and the minus for electric circuits. A charge pump is able to maintain a constant electric potential difference between the two terminals and thus allow for charge flow. Without this difference in electric potential, there cannot be any flow. It doesn't matter whether it's charge flow, 
water flow, or even roller coaster flow. You must have a difference in electric or gravitational potential to maintain such a flow. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, can I ask you to help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comments section below. Now for your action plan. Here are three resources that you'll find on our website, and I've left links to each in the description section of this video. You have a Minds on Physics mission and a Concept Builder, both great interactive questioning modules that will help make the learning stick. And you have two tutorial pages from our tutorial section. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H, and I thank you for watching.